El Fausto the Faust was a fishing boat with home in Tazacorte La Palma Island, Canary Island. At 14 meters, 46 feet, of over a length and a gross tonnage of 20 tons, 44,000 pounds, she was rather large for her category, so her services were requested not only for fishing purposes, but was often employed for the transportation of fruit, vegetables, easels, and other similar kinds of goods across the archipelago. She was equipped with a 43 HP Lister engine and had a top speed of 13 kilometers per hour. In 1968, Rafael Acosta was her owner, who for a long time had employed the brother Ramon and Eliberto Hernandez, age 47 and 42 respectively, along with their cousin Miguel and Viterbo Acosta aged 43 and 41 respectively, as the Fausto's crew. The four men were experienced sailors and fishermen, having been in the trade since their teenage years, and Raphael was very confident in their skills. July 20th, 1968. The Fausto leaves Cesar Corte. Julio needs a ride. During the early evening hours of the aforementioned date, the Fausto left Tazacorte's port heading to El Hierro Island. Some 80 kilometers south of Palma, she carried a cargo of explosives that would later be employed for agriculture purposes at the island. The Terrible was not on board that day, since a local festivity was being celebrated and he had previously agreed to take responsibility for some of the official acts that would be carried on in his hometown of Tazacorte. About seven hours later, the Fausto made her arrival to Frontera in the northern shore of El Hierro, where Ramon, Eliberto, and Miguel unloaded the cargo. That night, a fellow native of Tazacorte was in Frontera too. Thanks to his skills in mechanics, 27 years old and the father of two, Julio Garcia had recently got a job as an irrigation maintenance chief at a nearby private estate. That day, Julio got a call from his wife. Their two months old daughter was severely ill and the doctor had prescribed her antibiotic shots. He had tried to board the liner to La Palma as soon as possible, but missed it for a few minutes. The following one would not depart until two days later, a time Julio was not willing to wait to see his sick daughter. Desperate, Julio approached the boat docked at Las Puntas Fort. It was the Fausto. He talked to the crew about his predicament and asked to join them on the trip back to La Palma so he could reunite with his wife and children. Julio offered to pay them for the ride. They rejected the money and took him aboard selfishly. After fetching about 10 kilos of fruits for the 7-8 to eight hour trip to the Fausto, finally left El Hierro to La Palma at 2.30 a.m. of July 21st, 1968. None of the four men would set a foot on land ever again. Early morning hours of July 21st, something goes wrong. The Faustus crew had covered that route countless times, adding varying weather conditions, with no significant problems of any kind. That night, the sea was calm. Other fishermen would later report that a light mist had arised in the area that early morning, reducing visibility and making it harder for the Faustus crew to spot La Palma's huge mountains in the distance when the sun arised. However, those who knew the crew, including Rafael, had no doubt that the men were fully capable of navigating in those conditions. The Fausto was expected to arrive to Tazacorte at around 10 a.m. of July 21st. However, she never made it to there. Hoping to calm the fears of the four men's families, Rafael ordered another of his employees to sail from Tazacorte to Frontera. In other words, to make the Fausto's planned route in reverse with the hope of eventually bumping into her and finding out what had happened. The employee eventually radioed a report from the waters north of El Hierro. They had not seen the Fausto at any moment across the route, not even any trace of her. Up to this point, Rafael had thought that the Fausto had just experienced some kind of mechanic failure and was floating adrift somewhere mid-route, in which case she should have been found. 
He trusted his men and their capabilities, so with that report he suspected that something much more sinister was going on. Raphael contacted the authorities and the SAR team. July 22nd, looking for the Fausto. An emergency message was radioed to all the ships that could have been around the area and west from Archipelago. The Fausto was now officially missing at sea. At noon, a Casa 2.111 bomber took off from the island of Gran Canaria and headed west. Despite the thorough search and the optimal weather conditions of that day, sunny, no clouds, and excellent visibility, the plane's crew came back to base empty-handed. They hadn't spotted the ship, nor did the subsequent aerial and maritime searches to deploy it in the following days each of which increasingly more extensive. The idea of dealing no longer with a case of a boat lost at sea, but instead with a sinkage stated to take shape in the collective mind. The other possibilities that were being looked at were not comforting either, since the crew had only those 10 kilos of fruits with them and very little fresh water, their chances of survival at the sea were quite slim. There was no doubt that after a few days, they would not be looking for four men anymore, but for four dead bodies on a boat. July 25th, a radio message from the Tuquesa. Shortly after midnight, the maritime authorities received a promising radio message. The Tuquesa, Duchess, a British refer ship that was coming from South America en route to the Netherlands, had spotted a small fishing boat that seemed adrift in the ocean. The boat's crew was apparently using a flashlight to signal their position. They reported a location of 28 degrees 50 north, 19 degrees 45 west, which placed them at some 190 kilometers west of La Palma, way off the Fausto's original route. Not long after, the British vessel confirmed that the mysterious boat was in fact the Fausto. Ramon, Eliberto, Miguel and Julio were alive. Dehydrated, hungry, sunburned, and agitated, but alive. The good news quickly spread it not only across La Palma, but across the whole archipelago. It seemed that after almost four days of horror and hopelessness, eventually there would be a happy ending. With the help of Spanish-speaking crew members, the Duquesa could communicate with the Fausto. After giving them food, water, and cigarettes, they offered to tow them back to La Palma. And, unexpectedly, for everyone, at this point things took a turn for the strange. The four members of the Faustus crew rejected the offer to being towed back. Instead, they asked to be given enough fuel and food to make it back to La Palma by themselves. When asked what kind of medical breakdown or failure they had experienced, they replied that their boat was fine and that nothing was out of the ordinary. Sometimes later, the master and other members of the Duquesa's crew would point that, even though the four men were frightened by their near-death experience, they were far from being in the state of mental breakdown in which surviving castaways are often found. Nevertheless, the Duquesa indulged into their request. The Faust's crew received enough fuel for sailing 18 hours full ahead and a generous food and water supply for the trip. They watched the Fausto as she parted east back to the archipelago and the Duquesa radioed to the Tazacorte on ETA of 19 p.m. of that same July 25th for the Fausto. Back in Tazacorte, there was an overwhelming atmosphere of joy and relief. By 18 o'clock, the whole town had gathered at the port waiting for the Fausto's return. A celebration had stated, one included, with the foreman's families being the center of attention as they could barely wait with their eyes put on the ocean's horizon for their loved ones to come back. At 19 o'clock, the Fausto hadn't returned to Tezacorte. Everyone in the docks encouraged the crew's family members not to despair. They were assured that they would probably arrive soon, maybe in an hour or two. Hours passed by, the night came, and besides a few boats, that had sailed earlier in hopes of encountering the Fausto, no ship came from the horizon. Refusing to let their fears creep back into their minds again, the wives and children of the sailors stayed on the docks, where they would spend most of the night waiting for a boat that would never come back before giving up to the harsh reality. The Fausto was missing at sea once again. July 26th. The search continues. 
very early in the morning, this time not one but four CACA 2.111 planes took off from the Gran Canaria once more. The orders were clear, to fly up towards the exact point where the Duquesa bumped into the Fausto, establish such point as the new search ground zero, and once there, look for her in an increasing radius. Several other ships, both military and civilians, including the Castor, a search vessel, joined the search. A was requested to mainland Spain, which sent Grumman hydroplanes, as well as two Douglas DC-4, that would help to cover a search area in the ocean even larger than the whole Iberian Peninsula. At the time, the search for the Fausto became the largest search for a missing person in Spain's history costing over 1 million pesetas. This was over a few days period. In spite of the enormous effort and dedication put into the Fausto's case, the search was in vain. The Fausto was nowhere to be found in the ocean, and now the mystery was even more baffling than ever. Finally, on August 7th, the search was called off. The Fausto was now officially listed as lost at sea. October 9, 1968, 10.54 a.m. The Ana de Mayo finds something at the ocean. Two months had passed and little by little, the family members of the Faustus crew were coming to terms with the loss of their loved ones. Whatever it was what happened to them, it was clear that they were not coming back. For the rest of the society, the Fausta had started to become a thing from the past and life was turning back to normalcy. Meanwhile, at some point in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, the Italian merchant ship Ana de Mayo was en route to Venezuela. It was a dark cloudy morning, but besides that, sailing conditions were good. Everything was going smoothly and ordinary, when at 23 degrees 30 north, 38 degrees 30 west, they spotted something ahead of them in the distance. Upon closer inspection, they realized that they were looking at a small fishing boat, the kind that is not apt for cross-oceanic sailing. The boat seemed adrift, with no one at the wheel. Her call sign was clearly visible on the hull, TE-21268. Her name was Fausto. The Ana de Mayo stopped next to the small boat. First mate Luciana Asiona, along with a deck sailor, aboarded the deserted ship. No one was at the deck or the cabin, and given the good condition of the boat, it looked like her crew had just vanished without any trace. Asiona found no sign of violence or damage to the ship. He could not find any logbook aboard that could have explained what had happened. So far, that Fausto ship looked like a perfectly seaworthy ship that somehow had ended up in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean with no one on board. That was all the Fausto looked like until he opened the hatch on the deck that led to the engine room and climbed down inside. There was a dead man lying face up on the floor next to the ship's engine. He was naked, and a transistor radio was also found next to him. The man had clearly died much earlier, and probably due to the particular conditions of the oceanic environment, his body was almost mummified to a degree. Alarmed, Asiona commanded the deck sailor to come back to the Ana de Mayo and have the radio operator send a message notifying the spooky discovery. Meanwhile, he inspected the engine room thoroughly, trying to get a clue of what could have had happened. He found a small notebook that he thought may have belonged to the dead man. Upon opening, the first thing that caught Asiona's attention was the fact that a good number of pages had been removed. Eventually, it would be determined that 28 pages were missing from the notebook. From the remaining pages, the first one had a set of numbers. The last one with some content on it was the page that immediately followed the last one that had been removed. It contained a much more elaborate text that Asiona could not fully understand, but he could notice nevertheless that it was some kind of farewell. Asiona eventually returned back to the Ana de Mayo with the notebook and the very few documents found on the cabin mostly insurance documents. After five hours from the encounter, the Spanish authorities were already aware of the discovery. So were the inhabitants of La Palma. It seemed that once the mysterious body arrived back to Spain for further examination, at least they would get some answers. 
that Ana de Mayo had informed of their intention to tow the Fausto with them all the way to Puerto Cabello, Venezuela. They also promised to send to Spain an envelope with some documents found aboard. For some reason, they didn't mention the notebook until later. October 11, 6.30 a.m. A telegram from Ana de Mayo. After only less than two days from the Fausto's reappearance and subsequent decision to tow it to Venezuela, the Spanish authorities receive a telegram from the Ana de Mayo. The message is bizarre to the point of complete disbelief. They inform that, while being towed, the Fausto had sunk bow first during the night, ripping and dragging the towing cable with it. They state the position 19 degrees 46 north, 46 degrees 26 west, some 2.200 kilometers southwest from La Palma and some 3,000 kilometers northeast from Venezuela. The dead body was on the Fausto, therefore it vanished with the boat and could not be retrieved. All that was left now was the documents retrieved by Asiona. Eventually the notebook arrived to La Palma, where it was shown to the victim's families. It was finally Julio Garcia's wife Luz, who recognized it as her husband's notebook, in which Julio used to write down his personal notes and payments from those who had requested his services as a mechanic back in La Palma. Once in Spanish soil, the notebook's content was examined. The last page contained indeed a farewell from Julio to his young wife, in which he instructed her how to proceed with the insurances he had paid for and how to sell his properties, so she would not find herself with no money after his death. The text ended as it follows. Don't ever tell their then five years old son's name all that has happened to me. You know that God wanted this fate for me. Love you. Julio's address was written at the bottom of the page, and Luz confirmed that that was her husband's writing. As for 2013, Luz was still alive and still kept that last page of Julio's notebook. She never married again. The most striking aspect of that note, besides the fact that Julio was aware of his intimate death, was that it started abruptly and lacking context, which, along with the missing pages, led the investigators to believe that for some reason, Julio had documented in those missing pages the series of events that led to the Faustus' mysterious fate. Of course, a lot of questions were and are still raised. What was written in those 28 pages? Who removed those pages and why? What happened to the rest of the Faustus' crew? Why did they refuse to be towed back to La Palma by the Duquesa? Why did they say that nothing was out of the ordinary when they were found for the first time? Why didn't they offer any explanation of what had happened during their first disappearance? Suggested explanations. Let me start by stating that although there are several hypotheses of what could have happened, none of them is very specific. Instead, authorities, investigators, and sleuthers through the years have centered their efforts in debunking those theories that were very unlikely, and, in some instances, even absurd. For example, they were trying to reach Venezuela looking after a better life. Possible, but extremely unlikely. It's true that the post-war and the early stages of the Francois regime had sentenced millions of Spaniards to live in suffocating poverty, forcing many Canary Islanders to venture into crossing the ocean on small boats hoping to reach Venezuela, like their grandparents did in the late 19th century and early 20th century. However, the phenomenon took place mostly during the 1940s, when the famine was at its worst. By 1968, the Spanish economy has improved greatly, aided also by the tourism boom of the 1960s. At that time, the situation was no longer so bad that people would risk their lives in the ocean for a better future. What is more, at the time the regime had softened greatly and little by little Spain was becoming a more progressive society, in contrast with the rigid conservative politics of previous decades. Besides all this, none of the four men would have even thought of trying to cross the Atlantic with only 10 kilos of fruits and a few liters of fresh water. It would have taken them approximately a month to reach Venezuela, and a lot of few. Even with the supplies provided by the Duquesa, they would have known that that would have been a suicidal move. They witnessed something they were not supposed to see at the sea. Highly unlikely. Since this mystery took place at the most intense period of the Cold War, 
plenty of people inoculated with possibility of the foreman accidentally finding themselves in the middle of an U.S. URSS submarine attack or conflict. Keep in mind that only a few months earlier, the USS Scorpion had sunk at a relatively short distance of the Faust's point of disappearance, and many thought, and still think, that the cause of sinking was a Soviet submarine attack. Regardless of the veracity of that claim, what is clear nowadays is that back in the 60s, the North Atlantic had countless of American and Soviet nuclear submarines roaming across furtively. However, nothing in the Faust's series of events points out in that direction. They could have removed themselves from the situation after being rescued by the Duquesa, and the Anarimayo reported no appreciable damage to the ship when found. They were trafficking with guns, drugs, whatever illegal goods, they tried to avoid maritime authorities, and ended up lost at sea. Unlikely. While living modest blue-collar lives, None of the four men or their families was in desperate financial situation. None of them had big debts and they didn't have criminal records. They had no reason to put themselves or families at risk of violence or prison for extra cash. The boat was kidnapped by a Nazi fugitive that had been hiding at El Hierro and needed to escape to South America after knowing about Wiesenthal's effort to hunt former SS officials down. This was actually a possibility elevated to the category of urban legend that started to circulate across the archipelago at the time. Besides how oddly specific it is, I guess I don't need to explain why it's considered the most absurd hypothesis of them all. The most accepted theory about the Faustus disappearance states that they probably experienced a chain of small but successive setbacks that led to their fatisic fate. Due to the progressive worsening of the situation, the four men slowly turned irrational, frightened, and that agitated state of mind led to further mistakes and wrong decisions. However, what kind of setbacks or problems were those is something no one has been able to suggest convincingly. As vague as this is, given the lack of traces and the bizarre series of events, it's understandable that no one has been able to come up with a solid theory in 50 years.